Good afternoon and welcome back uh, from lunch. Those of you who took part in, in that, I know I did. Um, happy to be here today to introduce to you our next, or the speaker for this particular breakout session. Uh, he doesn't need a lot of introduction. Uh, I would like to point out that uh, many of the slides and video that you've seen, some of, an awful lot of the content, in fact, most all of the content, uh, was created by him. And so we certainly appreciate the time and the effort that went in that. I think he did a great job. And uh, we're very proud. I'm very proud to present to you today our own very own director of marketing for NARSOL, uh, Mr. Michael McKay. And he's going to uh, present to us um, uh, a discussion or, 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 or talking points about uh, the media and how we can engage the media and, and how we ought to, um, uh, you know, how we ought to engage with them in a positive way. So without further ado, Michael, you can take over now. Super. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, let me go to, uh, well, let me just first say that uh, I'm going to be moving pretty quickly uh, through this presentation. So it's going to be going at a pretty brisk pace. Uh, it's primarily because I'm riddled with ADHD, and uh, there's a lot of lot of information to cover here. So, um, if you have a hard time, um, if you're taking notes or you're trying to take uh, special interest in any particular slide, just know that we have some question and answer time at the end of the presentation. And uh, if you are registered for NARSAL Live, you will have access to these presentations for up to 30 days. So you can watch it over again if you want to. All right. So let me uh, first start out with a couple of quotes that I think are really pertinent to what we're going to be talking about. And the first one is by a guy named Reginald Murphy. You probably have never heard of him, don't know who he is, but uh, he was the uh, editor of the Atlanta Constitution, a publisher at the San Francisco Examiner, and the CEO of the Baltimore Sun. So here's a guy who really knows the media. In fact, he was the media for some 40 years in the United States. And what he said was, never do battle with anyone who buys ink by the barrel. And while that sounds like great advice, in truth, he and his uh, newspapers did battle with uh, some people out there. Uh, he was actually kidnapped by a right wing uh, militia group and uh, the Atlanta Constitution paid $700,000 ransom to get him back. So he knows a little bit about doing battle with the media. Uh, but even so, this is really good advice. Don't do battle with someone who controls information. Because even if you're actually winning, they can make it look like you're losing. The other quote I want to leave you with, or at least start out with, is one by a guy named Albert Hubbard. And he's a uh, turn of the century philosopher, and he said, an editor is a person who's employed by a newspaper whose business it is to separate the wheat from the chaff and to see that the chaff is printed. And I want you to remember this because later on in the presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about what the actual mission of the media is, and it isn't always to uh, get at the truth or present the truth. You might also know Albert Hubbard. You probably don't know the name, but you might know him as the guy who said, a friend is someone who knows all about you, but he still likes you. So let's start out uh, first by talking a little bit about where I'm coming from and, and uh, my experiences with the media. My background is uh, I did a lot of college journalism. I actually ran for city council when I was 22 years old. I was actually trained as a media spokesman at uh, by NATO uh, in a course called NATO CIMIC, which is the civil military cooperation course. And essentially what that was, was I was the talking head who got on TV to explain why uh, Sergeant Snuffy Smith ran uh, over some poor Germans BMW with a M1A1 tank or something. So I, I got a little bit of experience with that. I've been a freelance writer most of my life. I was a regional magazine publisher for several years. Um, I also was in uh, financial institution, public re relations and marketing. And I'm currently an editor at Lifetimes Magazine, which uh, shameless plug here is the only print magazine 
in the country uh, specifically for people on the registry and those who care about them. And as Robin mentioned, I'm the marketing director for NARSAW. So essentially, I have a little bit of experience in almost every aspect of the media. And that includes traditional media, which is print, radio, and television, and new media, which is blogs, uh, video logs, uh, things like YouTube, podcasting, and social media. Some of you may actually uh, know me from social media or my podcast or my blog. And uh, it's becoming much more prevalent today. In fact, my next slide tells you a little bit about how prevalent it actually is. At this point in America, uh, the, the numbers are about evenly split between people who get their information from television versus people who get their information uh, from online media. Uh, TV is about 41% of the people, and uh, it, I think it's like 38% who get their information from uh, social media or websites specifically uh, designed to uh, distribute the news. On the right-hand side there, you see a little bit of a, a chart that shows the trends. And the, the trend shows that media like TV, print, and radio are dropping in popularity and preference. And of course, the online media um, is rising. You don't really have to get too caught up in the numbers there, but just know that if you're ignoring social media, if you're ignoring uh, online news sources, you're going to miss out. So the first question we have to ask ourselves when it comes to getting our message out to the public is, is it newsworthy? And that's typically a, f a consequence of four factors, timing, significance, proximity, and human interest. Now, timing can mean a lot of things, but essentially, you have to ask yourself the question, why is this story timely? Why is it any more important today than it was two weeks ago? Or why is it uh, any more important today than it will be two weeks from now? So timing is everything, and it, it isn't always about your topic or your um, your mission, because, for example, if you were trying to get your message out now in the middle of mass protests all over the country and police stations on fire and that sort of thing, it's going to get lost in the mix. So timing counts for a lot. And you have to pay attention to what else is going on in the country to make sure that your message, your story gets out the way you want it to. The significance really is the question about why should anyone pay attention to your story? And this is where a lot of us fall short because we often don't see the forest for the trees. We're so focused on our own problem, our own uh, small bubble of concern that we haven't really asked ourselves why someone else might care about this. Sure, I might have gotten uh, mistreated. I might have been... Um, run through the ringer and gotten a fair a, a very unfair deal one way or the other but the bottom line is people are treated unfairly all over the country all the time and you have to ask yourself why would the public care more about my misfortune than they do about their own and i'm not saying there's a good and easy answer to that but you do have to ask yourself that question and proximity means more than just something happening in my neighborhood or my hometown it also means that it appeals to people who can relate to the story, right? Human interest, of course, you, you know what that means, but I wanna add a little bit more into that uh, perception, and that is the factor of emotion, because human interest works on emotions, and if it doesn't appeal to someone's emotion, and, and remember, this is why the registry is a problem in general because it was implemented through emotion. And the only way you're going to get rid of it is going to be through emotions. You know, there's an old saying that says you can't reason your way out of a situation that reason didn't get you into in the first place. And the situation we're in is a situation that uh, we have arrived at through emotion, out of control social, sexual panic, whatever. 
And that's the only way you're going to get out of that. Now, how to do that is really the $64,000 question. But another way that I, I like to explain this particular aspect of newsworthiness is the way I used to explain it to my boss when I was a director of marketing for a $150 million bank. I, I explained to him that all toothpaste is the same. When, you go, when people go out, when companies go out and sell toothpaste, they don't try to sell you on their brand because of the amount of fluoride in the toothpaste or the abrasiveness of the toothpaste or any of those things that are, that are physically and, and actually true about the toothpaste. They tell you that the toothpaste is going to make you more attractive, that it's going to make you sexier, that it's going to make you um, popular. It's an appeal to emotion. And that's the only way that the various toothpaste brands can differentiate themselves. And we've got to sell ourselves. We've got to sell our product. We've got to sell our message, our organizations, whatever it is that we're doing. We've got to sell it the same way these companies are selling toothpaste. We've got to somehow tug at people's emotions. Now, it doesn't mean we have to inflame them or get them to a point where people are acting irrationally, but we do have to appeal to people's emotions. And you'll see it, uh, that the most popular articles in the news are articles that tug at your heartstrings, make you feel something. All right, so keep that in mind. And uh, this kind of goes back to the, uh, the Hubbard quote that I started out this presentation with. And I, I want to talk for a little bit about the mission of the media. A lot of us have this misconception that the media has a mission of advancing the truth, digging for the truth and telling the world about it. The problem is that isn't really their mission. The media is a business, regardless of how you look at it. At, at the bottom line, it's a business, and they have, like any other business, a mission. The main mission is profit, of course. They, they have to make money. They have to be, there has to be some way for them to continue uh, paying their bills and uh, being there next week, next month, next year. So money has to come in the door one way or the other, and that usually means subscribers and advertisers. They also have to compete for readers or views or clicks if we're talking about non-traditional media. And sometimes individual uh, media representatives are motivated by their career or their personal agenda. You very rarely will see a reporter or a blogger or a podcaster presenting a viewpoint that differs from their own personal viewpoint. It's, it's extremely rare, at least presenting those other viewpoints in any kind of a sympathetic way. So never discount the personal agenda or the career uh, strategy of the people you're dealing with when it comes to the media. And one other thing that you might not have thought about is the media has a mission of scoring political points. You might think that the media is almost naturally a, an enemy of the politician, but that's not so at all. Uh, Take, for example, how many people in the media actually despise the president, and yet if he bans them from the uh, presidential, the White House um, press corps, they start screaming bloody murder. So they have to at least seem, you know, regardless of what their viewpoint is on politics and the politicians, they still have to maintain a working relationship with these people, or they don't uh, get to keep their doors open and, and continue to bring in advertisers and subscribers. So scoring political points is something that you've got to take into account. So again, let's let's start back at the beginning. Is the media our friend or are they our foe? And the answer is really neither. The media is a lot like that lawnmower you have sitting in your garage or the screwdriver you have in your toolkit. The bottom line is, if you know how to use it correctly, it can be your friend. If you don't know how to use it correctly, like that lawnmower, it can take off a, a hand or a foot, like a screwdriver, it can poke your eye out. So you've got to learn how to use the media to your advantage. Because the bottom line is, the media is going to use you to accomplish their mission. That's why they exist. And so there's nothing wrong with you using them to accomplish yours. The real question is, 
how do you do that? So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the specific things that you can do to accomplish your mission while allowing them to accomplish theirs. And it all really kind of boils down to a sort of Ten Commandments, which um, I'll just briefly go over, and then we'll talk about each one of these a little bit more in depth as we go forward. First, you got to do your homework. Second, you got to prepare. You got to set ground rules. You have to be language aware. You got to rehearse, but you got to stay unscripted. You have to learn to be brief, and learning that requires you to sometimes time yourself and practice that. You have to learn to stay on message, and this is a, it's a tough thing because there's just so much to talk about. There's so many things wrong with the system that it's really easy to uh, get distracted. And even if you have multiple agendas, multiple messages you need to put out there, you need to only present one or two really strong messages at a time. Otherwise, you dilute the impact of what your message uh, really needs to say. You have to learn to sidestep those gotcha questions. And we're going to talk about those in, in, in a lot more depth. Remember, nothing is off the record. I see interviews all the time where somebody says something really stupid and then they say, oh, that's off the record, right? You're not, you can, we can start over again, can't we? we you know, you're not going to use that, are you? Don't, don't believe that for a minute. They will use that. All right. And lastly, you need to be prepared to end things. And sometimes you end things on a high note. Sometimes you end things on a low note. But you do have to be prepared to end things. And this is something that very, very few people think about. And not just when it comes to the media, but in almost every aspect of life. You know, um, one of the things I do semi-professionally is I'm a stock trader. Everyone knows when to buy stocks. Nobody knows when to get out of a trade. Everyone knows how to start an interview, but no one knows how to end an interview. And remember, it's the ending that counts. You know, it's like the old joke where somebody jumps off the top of the Empire State Building and about halfway down, somebody hears them saying, so far, so good. It's the ending. That's important here. Okay, so uh, let's let's dive a little bit into these individual aspects. And the first one was, of course, do, doing your homework. Doing your homework means really looking at the media that you're dealing with. You know, what's their record of presenting a fair and balanced viewpoint in general? Not just about what you want to talk about, but in general. Have you noticed a, a trend uh, where they are um, presenting a, a strong opinion one way or the other instead of just presenting facts? Are they um, showing uh, favoritism on an issue? Um, you can kind of judge how they're going to treat your issue by how they've treated other particularly controversial issues. All right. And then uh, if they have con uh, if they have. Uh, dealt with uh, sexual offense registry issues in the past, how did they cover those issues? And one of the cool things that you can do is go back and look at some of the things that they have written or that they have presented in video or podcast form and see how they've treated people on this issue in the past. Um, this is really one of the cool things about the media is everything they do is public and is on the record and is easily searched and reviewed to to judge it for its fairness. One of the other things you can do is look for people who are who are mutual acquaintances with the uh, with either the podcaster, or the newspaper reporter, or the interviewer on TV. Look for people who had dealings with them before and, and see if they'll vouch for this person's professionalism. And finally, make sure you trust your gut instincts. Uh, there are a lot of times where you don't have anything solid to go on, but your gut will tell you that you shouldn't trust this person or this person um, is not going to uh, be someone that you want to deal with in presenting your message to the world. So trust your gut on that. The worst that can happen if you trust your gut and don't go with a specific uh, media outlet or a specific reporter, the worst thing that will happen is that uh, it'll delay your message or perhaps uh, allow you to present your message to somebody who's a little bit more sympathetic. So do keep that at top of mind, all right? Um, 
as part of your homework, you really kind of need to learn how to create a good press release. And a good press release is not a sales pitch. It's not an appeal for funding. It isn't uh, patting yourself on the back. It's not full of exaggeration or hype. Um, you don't want to glorify your your credentials or your background. And it, it should not be boring either. So, I mean, don't go overboard trying to make it exciting, but also be aware that if it's boring, it's not going to catch anyone's attention. And there are an awful lot of press releases that go out to the media that never get turned into articles. So just be prepared for that to happen. Okay. But the press release is a science, really. And you would really do yourself a, a large favor by learning how to create the perfect press release. So the perfect press release, and you can Google this if you want. There are just plenty of websites out there on how to create the perfect press release. But just in general, it says press release at the top. So that differentiates it from every other piece of junk mail that that reporter gets. And believe me, they get a lot. It has a release date on there. So they know when it's going to be timely, like we said back in the other, um, um, the, uh, the one of the early slides. <coughs> It has an eye-catching headline, and by that I mean um, not you know twenty point font, but eye-catching in the sense that it catches your interest. And it's only one page long. Resist the urge to make it any longer than that. If there are images, pictures that uh, go with your press release, do not do not embed those pictures in the actual text of your release. The reason is your your pictures, for, particularly for print and video have to be high resolution images and when you embed those pictures in your press release it automatically turns it into a low resolution photo which then cannot be used um, in any useful way by the media so always keep those images separate from the text of your press releases you should also you know have a, a, a decent introduction of your spokesperson whoever is supposedly being highlighted in the press release it has good credible quotes and these are quotes that actually sound like somebody is saying these things and you have no idea how many times I have seen press releases that have quotes that no one in their right mind would have ever uttered but there they are and it does not reflect well on uh, on the person or your message you want of course uh, like any piece of journalistic uh, Pros. You want to contain the five W's, which is the who, what, when, where, why, and also how. And any of those missing, and the piece becomes a puzzle for people that, and which then has to be figured out. And you don't want to make it that hard for them. And of course, you end it with the word ends or the pound signs, and you always have your contact information there so that they know how to get more information. Um, to round out the piece if it's missing anything. All right, one other thing you need to do, and this is something that every organization, particularly an advocacy organization, needs to do, is you need to assemble a press kit and have that always. In fact, this is probably one of the first things you got to do as an organization is assemble a press kit so that it's available at the drop of a hat anytime somebody uh, calls you, writes you, emails you, shows up at your front door, you have a press kit ready. And that includes a one-page handout summarizing who you are, your story, your message, any important facts or key players in your organization. It does include some biographical information and some good high-resolution photos, right? And fact sheets, graphs, charts, references to supporting data, because it's not enough just to put out some ideas to someone and expect them to believe everything you say. Journalists, by their nature, are skeptical people. They're going to check things out. They're going to go digging. And any assertion you make, they're going to ask you to prove. And so you should have that information handy, too. And you don't throw it all at them at once, but you absolutely do have to have it handy when needed. And that's part of your press kit. And then, obviously, more contact information for follow-ups and that sort of thing. Now, let's assume that you have finally been able to get the attention of someone in the media, someone uh, who might be a podcaster or a, a social media 
a personality or a journalist for a newspaper or even a producer for a, a TV show, you got to set some ground rules from the start. If you don't do that, it becomes a free for all. And honestly, the media representative hopes that you don't do this because they like free for alls. It allows them to basically do and say anything and then use all the juiciest parts of the interview. So you've got to set some ground rules. And even though they won't like it, it's something that they are used to, but they're hoping to God that you don't bring it up. All right, so one of the first ground rules and, and probably the most basic ground rule for an interview of any sort is do you consent to be recorded? Again, there's no right or wrong answer to this. Obviously, if you're going to be on television or a podcast, you have to be recorded. But just know that being recorded has its own pitfalls, including when you misspeak, make a mistake, you say something silly, you say something that uh, totally undermines what you just said five minutes ago. Those can be some rather discouraging pitfalls of being recorded. Unfortunately, with the new media especially, there's really not a whole lot of um, whole lot of options to being recorded. Another, and this is probably, again, really, really important, will there be restrictions on sensitive personal information? And by sensitive personal information, what we're really talking about there is anything that can be used by the media, whether willing, uh, wittingly or unwillingly, anything that can be used to make your life hell. And by that, I mean maybe you don't want your full legal name being used. Maybe you don't want your family members being named. Maybe you don't want your address or phone number or your employer's name to be broadcast to the world, particularly if they are not sympathetic in their reporting. Because in case you haven't noticed, we're, we're living in a cancel culture now. And if they air an unsympathetic piece with that kind of sensitive personal information in it, your life will almost instantly be turned on its head and people can be harmed. And I, I say this as someone who's been through it. I've actually had bricks thrown through my windows while I was incarcerated and my wife is home alone, bricks coming through the windows, people showing up at the front door, impersonating the police. These are some of the uh, unfortunate possible consequences of a media report that releases personal information about you. So you may think that there's nothing at stake here because you're already on a public registry. And so what could possibly be worse than that? Believe me, a lot can happen. And there are actually very few people in the world who actually go and look at your personal information on the registry. But everyone watching that TV show, everyone listening to that radio station, suddenly that information uh, becomes much more important to them because they didn't even have to go look for it. It was just thrown in their lap. So be very careful about your sensitive personal information. Another thing you want to think about before any kind of an interview is whether you're willing to discuss deep background issues. Now that could mean just about anything, but by definition here, we're going to talk about deep background issues as something unrelated to what you're talking about right now today. So let's say you are being interviewed about housing restrictions for people on the registry. And suddenly they want to talk about how and why and where and when um, you were arrested 20 years ago. That is way off topic. It's not why you uh, were, um, not why you were asked to appear or uh, asked to be a guest on a podcast or whatever. So that's a deep background issue that you don't want to talk about. We'll, we'll go into this a little bit uh, more at depth um, in a bit. But um, but just keep in mind that you should know uh, whether or not you're willing to discuss those and, and have a plan in place for that. And finally, you should be able to explain why these rules exist and what will happen if they are violated. So you have to tell the reporter or the podcaster or the, the interviewer, whoever it is you're dealing with as a media representative, you've got to be able to say, you know what? I don't want to talk about something that happened 20 years ago because I'm here to talk about 
um, how the system unfairly penalizes uh, people when it comes to housing. And, you know, and you sometimes will have to put your foot down and say, and if you don't want to talk about that, you want to talk about something else, then we're just going to have to end the interview and uh, part our ways. So this part here where uh, what will happen if the rules, the ground rules are violated, you need to know that ahead of time because once something crazy happens, it's really hard to make a rational decision because you're just blindsided and it's just not easy to um, think rationally under those kinds of conditions. So one of the areas, uh, you might want to talk about when establishing ground rules and talking to the media is how to encourage person first language. And a lot of people in the media are not familiar with the concept. And in fact, there are a lot of people in our own advocacy who are not familiar with the concept. So you have to be able to explain it in a very uh, short and rational way. And the way I explain it is, you know, if I had committed a crime, let's say I was a shoplifter when I was 15 years old, and here I am 30 years old. Would you introduce me to your audience as a shoplifter? That happened 15 years ago. That's not me anymore. I've changed since then. So you, you, you have to kind of present it in, uh, by framing it in that way. Uh, what, another way I usually do it is I just simply say, I would appreciate it if, if you would refer to me as a person with a sexual offense. Or at the very least, if you have to go with the whole word offender word, please at least frame it as former offender because I'm not a, an offender today. I don't, I'm not currently offending. Uh, and uh, some other things you might just get some practice saying so that it just rolls off your tongue are, I'm not my crime. I am more than the worst thing that I have ever done. And I'm not that person any longer. And, and practice does make perfect. These things will roll off your tongue a whole lot easier if you've said them more than once. Another thing uh, that I, I would like to stress here is that there's nothing wrong with rehearsing your interactions with representatives of the media. I, I, I get it. It feels stupid to rehearse. But if you think you're going to feel stupid rehearsing, just imagine how stupid you will look if you don't rehearse. And the fact is we always feel stupid when we are on camera, on the microphone. I'm feeling kind of stupid right now. But I don't sound it, I hope, because how I feel is not always how you come across on screen or on uh, in audio. So put aside how you feel for the moment and focus on how you're going to appear and how you're going to sound when you're talking to these media representatives. There's not a script necessary. People can tell when you're reading a script, but you should practice expressing key language key phrases, just like we saw on the last slide, and key ideas concisely. And the only way to really do that is to get someone to help you practice and get someone to listen to you. Because we, as human beings, we're very bad at listening to ourselves. I know we think we do a pretty good job of it, but we actually don't. You should also be aware of your nonverbal expressions, and that's body language and facial expressions. Uh, there's, a, there's a thing called micro expressions that most people aren't aware of. And it, it, your face does what it's going to do, sometimes without any prompting from you. And I, a great example, I think, is the, uh, the recent um, arrest, well, the, the recent uh, events surrounding Chris Watts in Colorado and his murder of his wife and two kids. Uh, this all happened last year. And you'll recall that uh, while his wife and two kids were missing, he went on television pleading for their return and, and begging anyone who knew about where they were to let him know. And he, 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 he really did his best to appear like he was frightened and worried and uh, concerned about where his wife and kids were. But a lot of sharp-eyed viewers were able to note that while he was saying that he was sad, his micro expression showed that he wasn't. In fact, there were many times where there were little smirks appearing on his face and, and little smiles, even though what the words were saying one thing, his face was saying something else entirely. So try to be aware of that if you're going to be interacting with the media. I know it's tough, 
And there's really only two ways to do that. And that is in front of a mirror by yourself or on video and going back and looking at yourself on video. And honestly, most people are shocked when they see what's really going on with their face and with their body language versus what's coming out of their mouths. And of course, we have to learn how to do it all in 30 second sound bites. And believe me, that is not easy. Another part of rehearsing is something that I call blocking, bridging, and flagging. Blocking is halting a specific line of questioning. Bridging is finding a segue from that to something that you do want to talk about. And flagging means that you reemphasize that the thing you want to talk about is important for some reason. So, for example, let's say someone from the media asks you uh, to comment on something that another organization is doing. You know, what do you think about how the ACLU is treating this particular issue? You block by saying, you know, I really can't speak for that organization. You bridge by saying, but what I can tell you is that our members think that this is a very important issue. And then you flag by saying, and, you know, we're, we're, um, the reason this is important is because it affects so many people. And uh, so many Americans think that this is an area where serious legislative reform is needed. So blocking, bridging, flagging, this is something that you have to learn to do, particularly given all of the gotcha moments that can present themselves when it comes to uh, particularly uh, podcasts and uh, television and radio interviews. So let's go over some of those gotcha moments where you get to practice that blocking, bridging, and flagging technique, okay? So here's uh, probably the most common um, ambush tactic that the uh, journalist can use is uh, simply an ambush. They bring you on to talk about one thing, but they, they want to focus on something completely different than what you came to talk about. All right, so maybe you came to talk about housing, and the only thing they want to talk about is uh, your offense or um, you know, how you would feel if somebody assaulted your family member. That's an ambush. Okay? Uh, another one is what we call a no-win situation. So they'll ask you a question for which there is no good answer. The, the question itself is the indictment. And I've seen this many, many times in the media. And you also will see it in your personal interactions with people. I saw it when I was incarcerated. You know, there'd be uh, a dozen, 20 people surrounding somebody uh, who's in prison for a sexual offense, and they're asking questions like, you know, what is it? What is it you find enjoyable about harming children? Well, there's no good answer to that question. And the minute you try to answer that question, that's where you are in serious trouble. So don't play the game. If there's a no-win scenario, don't play. And uh, you've all probably heard the the term non sequitur. A non sequitur is simply a conclusion that doesn't follow from the premises of an argument. So this is a case where 2 plus 2 equals 5. And uh, you'll see it a lot in the media when they restate something you said completely differently than what you actually said. So you'll say something like, you know, we need rational sexual offense laws. And they'll say, so what you're saying is we should just make rape and murder legal. Well, no, that's not what I said. And again, this is a it's a kind of a no win situation, but you've got to recognize it right off the bat. And you've got to respond to it in a rational, calm, and uh, likable manner. You, let's face it, you've got to be likable if you want your message to be received by the audience. All right, there's also what we call the ad hominem attack, a lot of Latin today, apparently, um, where the, the, the journalist or the podcaster or whoever it is simply uses your interview as an, an excuse or an opportunity to insult you. So instead of talking about housing or legislation or equal rights like you want to talk about, they'll basically say, well, you're just you're just a horrible, horrible person, aren't you? And how are you supposed to answer that? Well, you can't. And again, um, recognizing uh, that this is not a, a, a fair way to conduct an interview early is your best chance of uh, not having it turn into a disaster. Also, you got what's called deference to the mob, where the host is um, trying their best to look like a good guy. But what they do is they enlist others to do their dirty work for them. So 
you know, the host is really being nice to you, but then they say something like, well, let's hear what our callers have to say about you and your crazy ideas. And boom, you get a string of 20 callers calling you names, um, giving you verbal, you know, verbally harassing you, basically undermining everything that you had said and, and will say for the, the uh, remainder of the interview. So be really careful about that. And you might even um, discuss that if you know it's going to be a call in show of some sort, you might even discuss that with the host and say, you know, I'm, I recognize that there is some possibility that you, we get a lot of hostility from callers and, and maybe we should work out how that's going to be handled. And finally, let's talk about being a sock puppet for the media. And this is one that I see happen from time to time. And it's a very insidious thing that the media does, but they do it with great regularity. In fact, I'm going to show you an example of it in just a moment. This is where they somehow get you to say something that they wanted to say all along, but it just sounds more credible if it comes from you. And often they'll take your words out of context um, to make it sound like you are actually against something that you are in favor of or vice versa. So let's give uh, let's show you a couple examples of how this works. Uh, back in 2018, early 2018, we... Uh, saw a time where it was an instance where a registry reform advocate went on CNN and was interviewed by Ashley Banfield. And of course, the producers are all very nice when they get you on the show, to get you on the show. But once they get you on the show, the ambush is set. And essentially uh, what she said was, quote, I guess what I don't understand is how somebody who took a hammer to a 17 year old's head while he bound her with electrical cord and molested her wasn't sentenced to life. So she sets it up like, why isn't this guy, whoever we're talking about, uh, not necessarily her guest, but somebody else, why isn't this guy still in prison? It's basically what she says. And then she comes up with the zinger, which is, would you like one of your best girlfriends, your mother, your sister, your niece to live on the same street as this monster, basically? And how are you gonna answer that? Well, there is no good answer to that. Essentially, Nobody's going to feel great about living next door to a, an axe murderer, but that's not what we're talking about here. This isn't uh, you know, about our feelings. And uh, the real question is, you know, is it right to legislate according to how somebody feels? You know, because if everyone feels that you should be uh, run out of town, that should there be a law that allows that? And the answer is no. So you've got to learn how to react to these kinds of questions. And here's a guy that I usually consider to be a pretty fair interviewer, Dr. Drew on CNN. And he interviewed uh, a registry reform advocate on CNN back in 2012, where he seemed like a really nice guy. But then he allowed people to call in and voice their opinions. And ostensibly, it's so they can call in and ask questions of the the guests but really what it turns into is people calling in and just venting and one lady called in named linda and she said quote i can't let my children outside we don't go out in bathing suits people don't want to come visit me i can't babysit my nieces and nephews or have birthday parties and all because these people live nearby well consider that you probably go on a show like this to get your message out. But when the show becomes a platform for people who are just going to uh, attack you, uh, you're undermining your own credibility. So be really, really careful about that. And again, be willing and ready to recognize when things are not going really well and, be, and, and already have some decision about what you're going to do about it when they tend when they start going down that path. Now, this is a, a good example here of what we call the sock puppet um, phenomenon or the sock puppet interview. They, they found a registrant who was an advocate. They brought him on, the, on to be interviewed. I'm sure he thought in the beginning that they wanted to interview him to, to find the truth and to air the truth. But instead, you'll notice that while they're talking to him, at the bottom of the screen, it says, man claims he molested 300 children. So here you are talking about housing for registrants or fair and balanced, you know, and 
equitable laws or civil rights. And while you're talking, the big banner at the bottom of the screen is man claims he molested 300 children. Think about that for a minute. And then this man, the, uh, the news anchor, comes on and says, we're talking, of course, about Jack so-and-so. He claims that he molested 300 children before he was arrested. He says that offenders who complain about being monitored need to stop complaining. Now, do you for a moment, knowing what you know about uh, registry reform advocates and advocacy, do you think for a moment that that man consented to be interviewed by the news so that he could come on and say registrants need to stop complaining. No, he did not. But that's what the audience got. So again, these things can go horribly, horribly wrong. And you just have to realize that that is a, a very real possibility. And, and that means knowing when to stop. So one way you know how to stop. One way you can practice that is avoiding the urge to fill an awkward silence. And this is an, a technique that interviewers have used since time immemorial. And it's something that police use when they're interrogating you. It's something that conversationalists use to get you to open up. Essentially, they just stay quiet. And sooner or later, you get so uncomfortable that you just start blurting out things. All right. I'm sorry. I went a little too fast there. You start blurting things out. And that's not a good way to conduct an interview. So definitely don't ramble. If you have one of those uncomfortable silences that you're faced with, all you have to do is say, I hope, you have, I hope I've answered your question. Now the ball's back in their court. Let them ramble if they have to. So that brings us to the end of any interview. And again, like I said earlier, um, everyone knows how to get into these things. No one knows how to get out of them. And this is pretty much true of pretty much everything human beings do. It's really easier to jump into a pool than climb out of a pool. It's easier to start an investment than to stop an investment. They're just, it's just human nature. We don't know how to get out of something we get into very often. So recognize when an interview is going poorly. Be able to articulate why you're ending the interview. Don't lose your cool. Don't display bad behavior. Stay professional. And at the very least, you'll have that much going for you, okay? Well, I apologize for that. I had, I had, I had cut myself off, but uh, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, so I'm gonna proceed with the first question we have. Um, that's uh, whether or not you can address this, I am not that person anymore. Um, it says, in my experience, that kind of language lends itself to not accepting responsibility for your prior choices. I uh, say that I have learned to make better choices for myself today than I did in the past. So, Michael, can you address that? Uh, how do you deal with that with the media? Like you may be, may be trying to roll back into the uh, the room. Yeah, I saw that he dropped. Well, in any event, we have to... Let me take this opportunity just to explain to folks that at 2.30, this breakout session will end. And what you will need to do is to go back to the, uh, the, the, the URL you received for the, for the primary uh, webcasting event that you hopefully were on this morning. Um, so just, just, just want to go back to your email, grab that URL. And and then essentially you'll I think probably want to um, close out of here and open that URL back up, and that'll take you back into the main uh, session, the main webcast. Oh, great! I see we have. I'm Michael sorry, back. I'm back. Did you actually hear the question, or not? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. Somebody uh, somebody about? was asking. It's uh, I think it's a pretty good question. Somebody's asking, you know, how to deal with. How, how, when you're confronted in that way, um, how do you communicate the fact that you're just not that person anymore, that you're you're not the offender that offended, but you're, you know, here today uh, working in advocacy? How do you get around that? I think the, the way you get around that, and I'm, I, I don't want to get around it. I think the way you confront that question is you ask another question. And that question is, do you believe in personal redemption? Do you believe that people can change? And Overwhelmingly, people do believe 
that um, that people change over time. That uh, just because you were you know a shoplifter at ten years old doesn't mean you're a shoplifter for the rest of your life. Now, of course, that tends to lead them down the path towards well, but but that may be true for shoplifters or bank robbers, but obviously it's not true for um, people with sexual offenses. And that's when you get to point people to the actual studies, which show that in fact, people, someone with a sexual offense is no more, generally speaking, no more likely to commit another sexual offense than the average person on the street who has never had one. So I think you start with a question saying, do you believe that people can change? <clears throat> and then you follow that up with, then why do you think sexual people with sexual offenses are any different? Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, let's see. We've got about two minutes. The other question was quite long. Um, so I think uh, maybe we'll try to find one that's a little easier to. Sure. Easy uh, questions are good. Uh, somebody's commenting that they, they like your diversion tactic to answer a question with a question and to redirect. Um, mm -hmm. make the, thing, I think the thing you have to remember is not allow your, when you answer a question with a question, you have to make sure that your question is not confrontational, that your question needs to be enlightening and interesting and maybe even entertaining. Because if you, if you respond with a confrontational question, you immediately lose your audience and not just the interviewer, but the entire audience. And so you, you want to make sure that your questions uh, ease the audience into the mindset that yes, maybe change is possible, maybe redemption is possible, maybe even for people with sexual offenses. But you don't, um, you know, you don't ask a question that makes it sound like you're you're accusing them of being mean-spirited or a Nazi or something like that. Uh, and, and sometimes it's it's hard to do that because, you know, we get emotional too about these issues. But honestly, most times audiences will not react well to your emotion. All right. Well, that's all the time we got. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, folks, we will be going now to a 10-minute hard break. So it's uh, 2.30. We will uh, be, all of us will be rejoining the main webcast room at uh, 2.40. So enjoy your 10 minutes of break. Thanks, Mike. Thank you all.